I, I want to jump right into this. And so I want to introduce our panelists here. Um, uh, Paul April is a publisher, poet, and translator. He was the co-winner of the 2018 Annual Translation Prize of the French-American French Foundation for his translation of Giono's Melville, which was published by New York Review Books Classics. Um, Paul lives um, on the Niagara Escarpment in Ontario, Canada. My, I, I love that, Paul. <laughs> Um, Jody Gladding uh, is a poet and translator with five books of poems and 40 translations from the French. Her newest collection of poetry, I Entered Without Words, very excited for that, Jody, um, is due out this year from um, the Princeton series of contemporary poets. poets. Uh, her translations include, of course, Giono's Serpent of Stars and Occupation Journal, um, both from Archipelago Books, um, and she lives and works in Vermont. Finally, uh, great pleasure as well to have Jack Shoemaker join us today. When I kind of dreamed up this event, I realized I need to get Jack Shoemaker, who my real introduction to Giona's work uh, was through North Point Press. Um, Jack has been a bookseller and publisher, uh, which he just reminded us of for more than 50 years, somehow 50 years, um, a founder and editor of North Point Press. Um, he is the founding editor and editorial director of Counterpoint Press in Berkeley, California. With that, I, I kind of just want to like jump into this and I maybe how we'll start, um, as Jody suggested, is like, let's hear a little bit um, about how each of us, um, how Jack, Jody and Paul came to Giono's work. And maybe we'll hear a little bit, um, a little bit of, of the man himself. So, Jack, would you start us off and tell us how you came across Giono's work and, and maybe if you have a passage available for us? Thank you, I'd be happy to. I'm glad to be here and to join all of these wonderful panelists. At the close of the 70s, there was widespread interest in several kinds of spiritually informed humanism. It felt like a time of great and lasting magic, and some of us had developed incredible optimism for the future. Giono entered my life at just the right time. I first learned of Giono's work because the poet David Melser wanted us to read through the books listed by Henry Miller in Books in My Life. I don't recall how far we got along with that project, but each chapter promised a lunch and an afternoon drinking in North Beach, so I felt up to the challenge. But I won't ever forget the evening when my life was completely filled for the first time by Jean Giono. It was around this time when I could not keep copies of Morris Berman's The Reenchantment of the World in stock in my bookshop. There was widespread challenge to the mechanistic, gross materialism of the dominating scientific paradigm, and a new, if somewhat simple-minded, return to wonder and respect for a complicated view of nature became something holy and sovereign. And to keep matters hopelessly autobiographical, in 1979, I formed a partnership with William Turnbull to form a new literary publishing house. To get to know one another, I began to lend books to Bill for his reading, and we would then have breakfast or lunch to talk about them. Among the first was a copy of Joy of Man's Desiring, with a lovely romantic portrait of a deer the size of a European postage stamp stamped in color on the hardcover. Bill came back the next week holding the book like a precious object, and in many ways it was. And he said, if you can keep finding books like these, we can't help but succeed. I want to read the first couple of pages of Joy of Man's Desiring, and uh, I think you'll see right away why it was that I fell so much in love with him. It was an extraordinary night. The wind had been blowing. It had ceased, and the stars had sprouted like weeds. They were in tufts with roots of gold, full-blown, sunk into the darkness, and raising shining masses of night. Jordan could not sleep. He turned and tossed. The night is wonderfully bright, he said to himself. He had never seen the light before. The sky was vibrating like a sheet of metal. You could not tell what made it do so because all was still, even the tiniest willow twig. It was not the wind. It was simply that the sky came down and touched the earth, raked the plains, struck the mountains, and made the corridors of the forests ring. Then it run, ra rose once more to the far heights. Jordan tried to waken his wife. Are you asleep? 
Yes. But you answer, no. Have you seen the night? No. It is marvelously bright. She did not answer, but heaved a deep sigh, smacked her lips, and shrugged her shoulders as if to rid herself of a load. Do you know what I am thinking? No. I feel like going out to plow among the almond trees. Yes. The, the peace out there is beyond value. Yes. Over toward Fra Josephine. Oh, yes, she said. Again, she made that movement of her shoulders and finally lay flat on her stomach, her face buried in the pillow. But I mean now, said Jordan. He got up. The floor was cold, his corduroy trousers glacial. There were flashes of this night everywhere in the room. Outside could be seen as plainly almost as in daytime, the whole plateau and Grammont forest. The stars were everywhere. Jordan went downstairs to the stable. The horse was asleep on his feet. Ah, he said, you know anyway. You don't, didn't even dare to lie down. He opened the wide stable door. It gave directly onto the fields. When the light of the night was seen like that without a pane of glass between, one suddenly realized its purity. One perceived that the light of the lantern with its kerosene was dirty and that its blood was choked, was soot. No moon, oh no moon, but it was as though one were beneath glowing embers in spite of the onset of winter and cold. The sky smelt of ashes. It had the odor of almond bark and of dry forest. Jordan thought that this was the moment to use the new metal plow. Its limbs still wore the bright blue of the last fair. It smelt of the store, but it had a willing look. This was the time to use if ever there was one. The horse was awake. He had come to the door to look out. Time to use. There are the moments of great beauty and peace. If he is really to come, if he is really to come, said Jordan to himself, he will arrive on a night like this. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, um, it just. Yeah, how could you? How could you not <laughs> want to read more, more of Giono after hearing that? Um, Jody, I was hoping maybe you could could uh, introduce, uh, you know, how how you came to Giono and, and read a passage as well. This will be from your translation of, of Serpent of Stars. Serpent of Stars, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, my introduction to Giono was through Jack Shoemaker and uh, North Point. I remember the whole series. I think there were five of them maybe four or five and they were all different colors it looked like a you know kind of a, a something from heraldry um there was a yellow one and a red one and a blue one i think and they just always looked beautiful on bookshelves <laughs> and i think i started with blue boy also um and uh that was that was the beginning of sort of knowing who giona was and and being intrigued by him and his work um and it must have been mm, oh i want to say 85 something like that and then uh we is that right jack is that possible <laughs> yeah um and then the the next the next phase of this was um going to france for the first time in 1998 and 99. And um, I, uh, over the last 25 years, I've lived in France for four years at four different times. And that was the first, the first time there. Um, we were there for a year and I was um, doing French with my friend and uh, fellow translator, Elizabeth de Hayes. And she mentioned The Serpent of Stars as her very favorite of Jalen's books. And at the time, I was trying to learn my way into the language and the landscape. I was in a little village um, in Giono country, uh, a little uh, west of, of Apt. And, um, and so I read it in French. I, read, I, I borrowed her copy and read it in French. And I remember thinking it was so strange I had to translate it. Um, 
so <laughs> that that's how uh, it came to me. And I and and okay, so here's the copy I translated. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, a Grasset edition from 1933. Um, my husband found it at a in a bookstall in in Apt as a used copy. It was. Uh, I don't know, it was euros at the time. It says 50, I don't think it was. And the pages weren't cut yet. So while I was translating, I was I was cutting the pages. So, you know, it really was the whole experience of this book was very much in the book itself. And just like, take a look at those, those pages. You know, there's this huge border around it and the type is actual type. And the, the sense of a, a real physical experience of um, language, and landscape came through that, I think, largely for me. Um, and that, and, you know, yeah. And I think we, we just heard that in, in what Jack just read and you'll hear it here too. This is um, about the middle of Serpent of Stars and uh, this book is made up of, of kind of, I, I won't call them anecdotes, but little, embedded stories that different people tell. Um, and this is one of them, a, a shepherd is, is telling the story to the, the narrator of the book. Dawn arrived like any other, no different except for our, our flock, still all clotted together like bad milk, and our dog who could not stop trembling and wouldn't leave my side. I went to my boss's hut, Massamine, I cried, but the hut was empty. He had grabbed his blanket, shoulder bag, staff, and flask, and he had taken off. A shiver ran up my spine, especially as the dog came to sniff the empty hut, looked up at me, looked at the sheep, then took two steps across the grass. The sheep were asleep. The dog took off, extending himself into a long gallop. Then the sheep stood up. It was understood. They had risen and they hadn't shaken their heads like sheep just waking up, but instead they tilted their ears to catch the whistling of the grass under the galloping feet of the dog to trace his route. The dog stopped in his tracks. He sniffed the wind. He tried to lie low to make his way back toward me along the lower hidden trail. Then a huge mass of sheep packed together belly to belly rolled forward to block his path. I took my staff and started to run crying, Fado, Fado, when I heard Buscar's voice in my ear, if you hit them, too bad for you. And I stayed on my hillock to watch. All the clots of sheep were on the move like clouds in the grass. They ran, making great circles. Following a plan, they cried out to one another in an entirely new kind of plea. The panic-stricken dog was dancing about in the thick of them. Finally, they surrounded him, and he knew that his last moment had come. He no longer put up a fight, but I saw the sheep close in on him, engulf him, trample him, trample him to death with the great mindfulness required of a thing that has to be done well. I ran toward the rocks. From there, you could look down over our whole region and then the Vermeil Meadow and part of Norant. Above, I found the boss stretched out in the grass his hat over his eyes, and 14 of our poor men, their lips white with fear. Because below, it was like a thunderstorm struck. A stampede of running sheep filled the valleys. It tore up the fences. It seethed in beasts who leaped against our rocky hill. It ripped up the earth, and it ran in torrents, as determined as rushing water. In the midst of this noise, we heard the village below sound its alarms. When the night came, the boss lifted his hat. He said to us, count the fires. We focused our eyes to count the fires. There were no longer any more of ours. Far off on the mountain's large back, there were the other herds from Arl, Kral, Kumar, Albaron. And someone said, master, there are five Kral fires and three Albaron fires and 10 for the Kumar. Watch them carefully, the boss told him. He stared wide-eyed until it hurt. He stayed there a good minute and then he cried, Master, Master, they're going out, they're going out. No more Alboran fires, no more fires for the Krau, no more for the Kamar. Nothing's left, Master, nothing, they've all gone out. The boss lay down again and covered his eyes with his hat. As though he were speaking to himself, we heard him say, 
over there too. So it's the great revolt. So that was what I saw. Me, a little shepherd, something seen only once in a hundred years. This revolt of the beasts in an order that came from the sky with the smell of sulfur. This was what I saw and this is what I did. I took up my flute and I played very softly for myself. I played the sphere in my heart and the great voice of the mystery. That night throughout the world, there was a terrible noise of sheep bleeding and of bells from the church towers, of wooden houses cracking and the cries of men and the cries of women and the great angry stream which hurtled down the steps of the mountains. The scar said, play for us all. Then I took a good mouthful of air and with all the fullness of my breath, I began to play the flute for us all. Wow, what a yeah. passage. Um, yeah, there's a lot there that I, I would like to circle back on after we hear from Paul. Um, Paul, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us your introduction, maybe Jack Shoemaker again, <laughs> um, and, and reading a little bit. Yes, sure. Um, in 2004, and coincidentally the year that Jody's wonderful translation of The Serpent of Stars came out, um, my wife and I were in Toulouse in France studying uh, French at a university. And in a bookstore there, I started to notice a cover that really attracted me, but I hadn't actually heard of the author or read him. I might have heard of The Man Who Planted Trees, but um, Giona was unfamiliar to me. I picked it up looked at the back cover, started reading um, the first pages, and I was immediately captivated. And it was really the vitality and the textures of Giono's language itself that drew me in initially. Um, the, this, and its strangeness, as Jody said, there was something unlike anything I had ever read in any language. Um, and so that intrigued me. Um, and then I noticed, you know, the richness of his idioms and his imagery, which is really extraordinary in, in almost all of his writing. Um, and so I bought it and I brought it home. And so I read it in French. My first experience of Jonah was in French. Um, and uh, then uh, very, you know, in rapid succession, I read, I think another seven or eight of his books, including Le Chant du Monde and, um, I was, um, you know, a full-blown Giono fanatic at that point. And um, without, and I wasn't a translator, I had been a publisher, but uh, without any kind of um, particular plan, I sat down and started to translate. And it was Hill, Colleen, his first uh, novel that I chose to do. Um, so I guess, you know, something else that really um, continues to compel me about Jonah was his connection to the land and the ways that he celebrated traditional rustic ways through reenactment. I mean, he was so intimate with the, the lives of peasants, even though he was a town boy himself. He spent a lot of time up in mountain villages and he had a tremendous ear. Um, but another thing, uh, well, and he also had a, a, an, an extraordinary capacity to imbue his writing with the qualities of the landscapes themselves. Um, there are dynamics in his writing that almost reproduce natural processes. And I found that really extraordinary. I mean, I have a term that I use for myself about that. I call them textscapes. Um, there's something really alive about the actual writing that is very rare, very, very rare. And I think that's something that Jack, you you know, you know, obviously responded to when you first encountered him. Um, there's really no one like him for that. And uh, unless perhaps you look towards Whitman and maybe a, a romantic poet like John Clare, whom I adore, um, who had that same kind of um, deep, deep response to what David Abram, the eco-philosopher, who I think is, with us today, um, calls the more than human, um, you know, to actually attribute sentience to the non or more than human. Um, and, because Jono was an animist, I mean, literally an animist. And um, I think that's a kind of sensibility and a kind of respect for the environment, for, for what lies outside of the human so-called civilization, 
that is, is increasingly important, that we have to learn to respond to that to, and to, to honor it and to preserve it. Um, so uh, I translated uh, Colleen. Um, I got very fortunately, it was accepted by New York Review Books. And then they asked me to translate a journal title that I had not read. Um, in French, it's called Pour saluer Melville, Melville being Herman Melville. And the background to that is that Jono had taught himself English, which is incredible. He had only a high school education. He, he, someone turned him on to Melville and he actually read Melville on his own. He carried it around in, in his satchel and because he was a tremendous walker, he would take it up into the hills and you know the wind would be flapping the pages and he would be imagining himself at sea and seeing the terrestrial landscape as a marine landscape. It was just an amazing kind of immersion that he had. And he loved it so much that he persuaded a, an artist friend of his named Lucien Jacques to translate Moby Dick uh, together. Um, first translation of Moby Dick into French ever, which they did. Um, they had some help from other people along the way. It was published, and when it was published, Gallimard, the publisher, asked Jono to write a preface that would be included in the edition, but Jono, in his typical fashion, um, took this as a sort of pretext to go into a tremendous kind of fan literary fantasy, which became a sort of novel that he called Pour Saluer Melville, and I've called Melville a novel just because if it had just been to honor Melville or to salute Melville or whatever, it would have sounded more like a fest trift or, you know, so we chose to call it Melville a novel. And it's from that book that I would like to read. Um, I was struck by similarities. In fact, Jacques, it had been a long time since I had read um, um, Joy of Man's Desire in French, I read it. Um, but I, uh, I hadn't realized how close some of the effects are in the passage I've chosen with the, the opening pages of um, uh, Que ma joie demeure that you read from. So here we are. The, the, the context is that Giono has sent Herman Melville, who did go to England in 1848 to see a publisher about the publication of his novel White Jacket. Um, but he didn't go on a a, a coach ride into the West Country, which is what Jono completely made up. And he also made up an encounter with a woman whose name turns out to be Adelina White. And there's a little bit of a Romana Clay aspect to that because um, Jono had a very close relationship with a woman named Blanche Mayer. And so this character in the novel, Adelina White, may be actually someone Jono had quite a good <laughs> let's not go into any details but you know so there's that and um they are so they are riding together in a coach the bristol mail coach in in the west western part of southern england and herman is um well you'll see he just starts to describe the landscape to adelina in the distant, motionless reaches, Herman saw an extraordinary light. It transformed the misty crepe of the far-flung woods into lamb's fleece. Rust-colored pasture lands covered the earth like wool carpets. So now Herman started to talk about the world that lay before them. He rolled up the sky from one edge to the other, as though it were made out of colored silk. And for a brief moment, there was no more sky. Then after an interval of four hoofbeats at a gallop, he rolled the sky open again, but now it had turned into a huge skin, tightly enclosing earth's arteries and veins. Autumn storms were slumbering along the perimeter of the plateau. He pointed out an indentation in the sky between two snowy masses of cloud it was in the shape of a leaf. It was a nocturnal green, and through the color, one saw the infinite depths appear. Do you remember having held a bay leaf in your hands? Yes, 
Do you remember the color of the leaf? Yes. As dark as night? Yes. But green all the same? Yes. A kind of green that seems to come from very far away, that rises up through the dark color as though the leaf itself were a world? Yes. As if chasms were opening up in the leaf? Yes. And so suddenly she had that indentation of the sky in her hand. She felt the chasms in the sky grow deeper in her hand. She saw them right before her eyes. She knew that she was very small, that the sky was infinite. But now it was she who was infinite and the sky very small. Simply because she had once held in her hand a bay leaf whose flesh is the same as that vast, dusty cloud of dark green sand, the night. And above all, because a voice had just named it for her, had fused the two images, had shed light on them. He made the woods come closer. Had she ever seen a wood the way he was making her see it? No. He revolved it for her, turned it upside down, turned it inside out. The eastern edge, the western edge, the mysteries of the north and the south, the moss, the fungus, the scent, the color. Had you seen it? No. Have you seen it? Yes. He sent the woods back to where they'd come from. They retreated, shrank, lay down again at the rim of the horizon. Had she really noticed the birches with their horsehide bark? No, he summoned the birches and the birches came. She felt them not just right next to her as if she was in an ordinary field and had leaned against one. She felt them in her heart. He took hold of the tree with its sticky sap, its sound, its smell, its shape, its leaves, its four seasons. And there was no telling how he did it, but she felt the tree in her heart. And at the same time, she could touch the bark. She'd never had a sensation as pleasurable as that of her empty hand, imagining it was touching the birch and sensing through it the things he was saying. He said to her, look at the water in those little marshes. The water moved closer with its rushes, its tadpoles, its frogs, its moorhens, its ducks, its kingfishers, all of its bird feathers, its cottony, flowering canes, its muck, its smell of rain. Hold on, let's stay with the smell of rain. You'll see. He sustained everything else, only he lowered its register, as if he were lifting off ever so slightly the pressure from the pedal of a big cathedral organ. The birds, the fish, the frogs, the canes, the whole of the muck-filled marsh drone together as a basso continual accompaniment from the vaulted recesses of the earth. And he made the smell of the rain sing as a fugue. Wow. I'm going to... Um, yeah, everyone is unmuted now, and I... Um, it's amazing the the overlap there. No. This wasn't planned. <laughs> you three didn't. <laughs> I mean, you sort of get at, you get at it immediately. What what Giono does. I mean, this is Jody. You mentioned language and landscape, and Paul, you mentioned this amazing term, mm. te textscapes, and and this living, breathing, volatile world that you know in that passage comes and goes and draws near and. Um, yeah. I, and and to me that's Dan. I think that but was the thing. It, oh, sorry, it's Jack, a go fantastic ahead. passage. I want to get off this meeting and go find my, a copy of Melville. <laughs> you know, uh, the, that reminded me of a story that I heard first when I was uh, in France. The only time I've been there, and that was that Giono had been asked to write the history of Perrier, the Perrier yeah. Water Company where its anniversary was maybe like a hundred year anniversary or something, asked him a famous celebrity writer to write the history of their water company. 
and he did so. He wrote an entirely fantastic false made up out of whole cloth history of Perrier. And they so much loved it that they adopted it, printed it, and used it. So I've always wanted to see it. Uh, it's got to be better than the real history of Perrier. <laughs> That's yeah. so parallel to the story of the man who planted trees, which is by far his best known and most you know prolifically published work, because he made that all up. He was commissioned by Reader's Digest. Yeah. To and they were getting writers from around the world to write about the most interesting person they'd ever met. So Jono made up an interesting person, and they sent inspectors down, and they 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 kind of found him out, and and they they refused to publish it. But eventually, Vogue magazine published it in the U.S. in an unattributed translation, and then I believe, and I didn't mean to get into this much detail, but Chelsea Green Publishers on their website state that they that they've printed more than 250,000 copies of that book yeah with beautiful woodcut illustrations by uh yeah. mccordy i think that is his name um, yeah. yeah yeah well yeah those passages all point to this language and landscape and this kind of intertwining of the human and the non the more than human that that was david's phrase i think you, you said mm -hmm. Paul. Um, mm -hmm. and i wonder you know it seems in such stark contrast to a lot of contemporary fiction that we kind of, a lot of us live in like what is now sort of a placeless world. Like you can, you can interchange our places and, and, you know, um, especially in, in kind of more urban settings, you know, you go to any downtown and there's your, your hard rack ca cafe or whatever, you know, you, we live in these kind of placeless worlds. And, and so I wonder what it is about Giono's D you know, his, his sense of his place um, and the sort of inextricability of the human and the and the more than human that that draws you as translators, as readers, as publishers. Um, what is that that kind of vitality there? Um, animism, as you mentioned, Paul. Um, because to me, that was the most striking thing. I think I mentioned that I read Hill it was pandemic. It was fall of twenty twenty when I when I finally got around to reading it. And that was you know we were Bay Area, Northern California was swathed in wood you know fire and smoke from from the fire side there was a fire in point rays and i read that book in it and it was sort of like both you know prescient thing but also it felt you know it felt like the world was alive in this way that i think we can often forget and giono doesn't want us to forget um and so that kind of all circles back to this like you know he's is he being rediscovered what is it about you know his his outlook that that maybe drew you or, or that you think you know feels pertinent to the moment um one thing i i keep coming back to is how the ratio of the human to other elements in the landscape is so different from urban areas <laughs> and and that mm -hmm. um the human element is only one of you know all the other forces that are at work there i think all the readings we did mention sky like sky is this incredible force for giono it's a live thing and and the pasture land is alive every everything the trees are alive a live thing and the humans are are such a small part of that it's very much like chinese art in that way and i think what comes out of that is the sense that there is there there are these natural powers and, and they are the dominant ones. And for our world right now, <laughs> where it mm -hmm. seems like, you know, they have no power and the dominant powers are all political or, or wh whatever, um, mm -hmm. to have books that don't like say that, but enact it in ways that you, you know, just really feel, viscerally feel, um, for me that, you know that that's where it all go. That's what it all goes back to. I think. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, it's fantastic. Um, he 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 was a kind of medium, I, I guess. You know, like like you say, J Jody. Um, he was a witness. He was channeling these energies, and because he recognized that there was a spirit, a sentience in trees and even in rocks you know and in in the weather um it, it gave him an extraordinary power 
-hmm. And the fact that he was just absolutely soaked in Whitman, you know, from an early age, I think that also contributed to that kind of capacity. Um, and his cataloging, he would catalog in a way, I don't know, you know other, any other writer other than Whitman who would do that, who would mass mm -hmm. up, you know, all these different mm -hmm. images. Right. Well, it's, it's the sky and it's stars, isn't it? Uh, it's yeah. almost yeah. like civilization was uh, determined to block out the view of the stars for modern people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're living in an urban landscape, you can't see what Jonah writes about constantly, mm -hmm. but he's a, a rural person mm -hmm. and he was writing mm -hmm. from a rural landscape uh, that is really so rare now. I think that's Very the, much. the magic. Uh, we've had enough of Phil Roth and of urban landscapes to mm -hmm. fill us up. And this other opportunity is, is a, it feels like a brand new opportunity to, to have magic in our mm -hmm. lives. Absolutely. That's the mm -hmm. word. You know, Jack, I was really pleased to see your name in, in an article, a very fine article by Dorothy Wickenden in the current issue of The New Yorker about Wendell Berry whom you have published. And I couldn't help but be struck by the affinities between Barry and Giono. I don't know if Barry has read Giono, yes. but that same deep, deep connection with the earth, the celebration of natural forces, the deploring of mechanization, you mm -hmm. know, the sense of locality. There's wonderful line that I remember from it. I think he said that it was speaking of Ernest Gaines and he said that Gaines had shown that the local fully imagined becomes universal. And, and I think that's really pertinent to Giono because this was something that I think was part of the sensation that Giono caused in Parisian circles when, his, when Colleen came out in 1929. They'd never, they'd never seen or heard or read anything like it. But here's this provincial guy talking about the details of life, peasant life in a tiny remote village, but somehow it had, it, it, it felt like classical literature. I mean, because it, it was using a lot of the same ideas. The, uh, Wendell has read Giono. In fact, uh, his, one of the first books I published of Wendell's was on the same list as the list with Joy of Man's Desiring. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I read that. Yeah. Uh, well, I was reading that article too. Um, and, and what struck me is they're both uh, cranky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. they, I mean, they are. They just are. And, uh, and, and kind of resolutely so. So it yeah. you know, becomes a. Yeah. Um, well, uh, if you think of Giono's political stance in the Second World War, uh, he was a pacifist. Yeah, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. it was impossible to be that in the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I spent a long time. He was living on a commune. I spent a long time in the 70s after Meltzer had turned me on to copies of uh, Joy of Man's Desiring and Song of the World, trying to get a New York publisher to reprint Giono. This is like mm -hmm. 1975, say. And nobody would touch him because yeah. his reputation was that he was a fascist collaborator, yeah, well, sympathizer, yeah. and that he was a, a, a pacifist at a time when that stance was, had been irresponsible. Right, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're yeah. very much a, pass, a Christian pacifist in his work and uh, argues that I've published many of his pieces where he's arguing against war as a method of, of solving problems, whether it's Iraq or the Civil War, he's against them all. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine what, how Jonah would have reacted to what's going on as we speak? Yeah. You know, yeah, well, and Jody, I mean, you, you know, you did the, the Occupation Journal, which is an incredible record of his right. thoughts. Right. Um, and I, can I, Stephen, Stephen would be, it be okay if I read a few things from that? Because I feel like this mm -hmm. is the yeah, I would love that. Yeah, it's yeah. very, yeah, very pertinent um, to the moment. Uh, I just picked yeah. out some really short things to give a sense of how you know how this journal works and and what is important to remember about it in reading it because um, 
it's a it's a big book and it it does a lot of different things and um i don't know it's really pretty amazing so this is um he kept this during world war ii when france was occupied and it it's his occupation in terms of his work but also that political moment um and it, he started it in the fall of 43 and um the last passage is the spring of 44 um no the fall of 44. so i um this is september 25th 1943 and I, i'm just reading little bits um thunderstorms a beautiful autumn sky inhabited by giant clouds a very long southern wind extremely so slow gestures from the storm thunder like syrup that doesn't clap but collapses Elise, who is obsessed with the thought of the noise of battle, and the girls sometimes think it's gunfire. Basically, it's important to live, not the idea that others form of your lives. One must try to write to create above the whole legend. If I can't do that, too bad. I will have tried, and that will have been interesting. The arrival of the storm's great darkness is very sweet to my heart. This is quite a bitter book, a lot of it. Um, you know, he, he he knows it's impossible to be a pacifist, to be apolitical, and he's doing it, and and it makes him bitter. Mm. He November was. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I thought you were done. Yeah. Um, November fourteenth. I'm trying hard to record as precisely as possible the most ordinary everyday events. My taste for invention can lead to an obscure lyricism. I need somewhere private, not meant to be published, where I can practice scales, exercise my fingers on tougher disciplines. I must try to express these small everyday events quickly and in the most accurate way possible. Stick close to and describe what happens. The most commonplace, invent nothing. Acquire that style if possible. It'll at least allow me to feel my way maybe for two or three years. But I enjoy this effort. So if by the end of that time, I've only acquired mastery over myself, if invention no longer masters me, which is always the case now, then it will have been worth it. So there you get him, you know, this is Fiona, the inventor who knows he is and is trying not to be, and he has a hard time with that too. This is November 17th. Um, Sylvie and Aline are his daughters, and he's, this is, uh, Sylvie is studying history. Her mother has to recite her lesson. What is a border? Sylvie, it's a line where there's an enemy on either side. <laughs> wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah. this is May 12th, 1944. Two o'clock, I was going to lie down on the divan. Aline came running up the stairs, a German officer and a soldier down below. I heard May May calling Charles. I told Aline to have them come up. An officer and a soldier with a submachine gun enter. The officer salutes, approaches. He's come to have me sign two books for him and his commander, who he says is an archbishop. He emphasizes archbishop, which tells me that, then tells me that actually his commander is a Protestant archbishop. A little later, the book signed, they leave, frightening, but no harm done. Mm. And there's just, oh, just one more. This is May 29th. It rained later. Late, rather late in the day, a small storm. The sound of it seemed extremely peaceful. It brought comfort and peace. It was reassuring. It was ahistorical. Yeah, something that struck me with the, the Occupation Journal, as well as The Man Who Planted Trees, is uh, the sort of dedication and patience for work. You know, so much of that journal is, is Jonah Gion, recounting what he's reading or what he's, you know, he's an artist and he's living through this this occupation and this time with this very firm principle um and and you know and i you see that reflected in a lot of his work is, is sort of patience and persevering in the face of whatever mm -hmm. disaster you know the disaster of modernity maybe he, right. he, he, mm -hmm. well the disaster of imprisonment he was imprisoned twice for his yeah, pacifism for, yeah for defeatism well, right that's that's how defeatism yeah. at first and then and then collaboration or an accusation of collaboration never really convicted but blacklisted, you know, so so wrongfully. And if and, you and leave, no, no, yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, I think Occupation Journal wasn't published in, in France until the mid-90s, is that correct? No, it came out when the, when um, Gallimard did the big play ad of, of Giono. And, you know, the, the one passage I read where he says, this is not to be published. Like, that, I think that's a really important thing to remember reading it, that it what he, he didn't intend it to be a, a public a public um, thing. So he, he he is free in this book in this journal in, in ways that he isn't in in his other his other work and i think you know Stephen, to your point the whole like effort to write it, i think it was not only just discipline but but i think there's an effort to believe that writing matters too and and that you know you can see in there where he just like says this is i've never written a good thing in my life you know or it, it, the sense of futility of that enterprise given the situation even as he's trying really hard to you know keep out the larger the larger world mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah i think he really did view writing um a, as a vocation i mean that's not unusual but also almost as a kind of artisanal craft um right. the way he, he he wrote he he hand wrote all of his books he never typed and um and and I think that during the war, he felt uh, committed to continuing to practice his craft in that sense. As, as he has that in common with Wendell Berry, who never has typed. <laughs> yes. He writes all of his again. work on yellow tabs, yellow Yes. Tabs. Mm -hmm. And the same, Giono's wife dutifully typed out his, his manuscripts. You know, there was a partnership. But, um, the, the manuscript for Occupation Journal was up in an exhibit in Marseille when I was there the last time. Um, uh -huh. In these you know, big vitrines with all the pages. And there are no corrections in it except on the very last page. He crossed Amazing. out one line and put in in red over it another line. And that, you know, that Amazing. was the end of the exhibit. It's, and he wrote so fast. He wrote um, the um, Les Grands Chemins, the other novel that, that I've done that's been published by NYRB. He wrote it in less than three months, you know, and it's a reasonably long, it's a 70,000 word novel. Huh. And um, the one I'm doing now, Fragment d'un Paradis, and this is typical Jono too, this is his sort of, um, you know, Joker personality. He loved, he liked the idea of playing tricks and of, of like he did with the man who planted trees. He claimed that he had dictated this book in a, over a period of three or four days and that it had not been, there wasn't a single correction. Well, the truth is that he wrote it only in a few months, a few years later than he said he wrote it, but he wanted to place it in 1940 because of what it's about. But he, 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 he had this prodigious application to, to his, um, his, his own inscription and uh, I've had and uh, the the joy of visiting his his home in Manos, which is now a museum. And they've kept everything, his desk, all of his he had these pens with these very long handles and you know nibs. And he would sit and sort of, you know, almost uh, like a painter. And he had beautiful handwriting, as you say, Jody. Um, according in in occupation journal, he starts the fragments. And he, he, he did does, start yes. it. Yeah, he did yes. start it by by dictating it. And then, you know, yeah. he, and he has real questions about how that's working. He keeps saying, Oh, yeah. I think it's <laughs> yeah. great. And then the next day he goes, Oh no, it was really garbage. I better start over. So, yeah. Well, it kind of gives him a lot of license stylistically because there's an I'm finding this, I don't, you know, there's an enormous amount of repetition, but mm -hmm. that's part of Giono's orality. That's another quality mm -hmm. that maybe we haven't mentioned that it, he is a remarkable kind of immediacy. You feel like the story's being told. And then he slips like any oral storyteller and it's maddening again as a translator. I'm sure you can attest to this, Jody, that he will move sort of without notice seamlessly between tenses. Like he starts mm -hmm. out, you know, as you would tend to do as a storyteller in the past tense. Oh, well, so this thing was happening in this village, you know, in 1908 or whatever. And then all of a sudden it's in the present tense because he, he has a, a captive audience. Um, so I think that, you know, he was always in that kind of oral and almost bardic vein, uh, at least it was one of his dominant ways of writing. 
Wasn't he at one time a storyteller on the radio? He did a lot of radio work. I thought so. Mm -hmm. You think about the writing a manuscript that way by hand. Um, Wendell does that and has his whole career, but he he, does, he doesn't have a lot of corrections on the page because, as he says, I will only write with a pencil. You can <laughs> erase a lot. Yeah, that's in the New Yorker article. <laughs> that's another nice detail. Well, Jonah was, I think, very similar. You know, it's amazing how little correction he did of many of his manuscripts. You, Paul, you mentioned that. I have to excuse myself. I have a, an important family duty that I have to take care mm -hmm. of with a four-year-old. But I really enjoyed this, and I will mm -hmm. hope to see you all again. Thank you, Jack. Jack. It's so mutual. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. this, joining us. So happy to have. Thanks for introducing so many of us to uh, Giono's work. Yeah, truly. Yeah. Well, I want to, so the two poets are left here and I want to ask, you know, we talked a little bit about um, the sort of translation work and things. How, you know, how has, has translating Giono mm -hmm. changed your, your own writing? Um, or have you, have you incorporated or has that made you think about your own writing in ways, Paul, you mentioned sort of his orality. And, and you know, I find, mm -hmm. I found with Bill Johnston's recent translation, uh, Enamond uh, from Archipelago, mm -hmm. it sort of mm -hmm. seamlessly moves from story to, you know, and it moves in these very strange mm -hmm. and very oral ways, um, mm -hmm. kind of seamlessly. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. But has it, has it changed or affected or made you think differently about your own language? Well, I think I would defer more to, Jody to answer this because Jody is much more of a practicing and published poet than I. I've written poetry all my life really, but I think for me it might go more in the other direction that the fact that I have written poetry and have a sense of prosody and um, you know how, how rhythm, cadence, I think cadence is a key in, in translating uh, Jono successfully and it's there in Jody's for, for beautifully and I hope in mind that, you know, if you've worked, if you have grappled with those issues in your own writing of poetry, mm -hmm. then you bring that, whatever sort of facility you have with that, to rendering Giono's prose, because he himself acknowledged his prose was extremely poetic. And he even said about Colleen, that when, which is his first novel, well, he had written in a, but the first published one, that when he started to write it, he intended, yeah, he intended to write a novel, but in fact, he wrote a poem. Hmm. It's in prose, but well, prose poem. And and the um, Fragment in Paradis that I'm working on now, actually, and it's in prose, actually has as a subtitle, poem on the title page. Just poem, which is poem. So that's my answer, but Jody, I think, yeah, you, you're the poet. <laughs> um, huh. it, uh, it's a really good question. I don't have a really good answer. Um, <laughs> I think uh, that translating in general makes one very aware of uh, language as a living substance. And, um, and, you know, maybe it's more that than, than any particular, what happens on the page, anything particular that happens on the page, but more just mm -hmm. the sense of this material that you're, you know, working with and it has a life of its own. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, more true for Giono than than really anyone else I, I've translated. So I, I think I think that's what I would um you know thank him for if, mm -hmm. if I could. Uh yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um Paul I want to come back to one thing you said about the um presence of water and the ocean uh mm -hmm. in in all his work and there's just a really short passage in Serpent and Stars. I'm sorry I'm reading so much but I just oh. It's great. You know, we, should get, <laughs> we should get his time here. And it has to do with, with that um, because the landscape itself where Gianna was is very dry. 
really, really dry. You know, so it doesn't seem like there should be um, this obsession with water. But he explains it. This is like halfway through Serpent and Stars. In the preceding pages, you will have found an obsession with water and the sea. That's because the herd is a liquid thing, a marine thing. From Crow to the Alp, there are only dry rivers, streams. That's my clock. <laughs> hey. I'm going to let it have a Might say. be in a French village. <laughs> <laughs> it also means flowers up, right? <laughs> Okay. From Crow to the Alp, there are only dry rivers, streams which transport cicadas and lizards. The herds climb into the thorns and the furnaces of dust. Yes, but this flood grating the ground with its belly, this wool, this deep monotonous tone, it all gives the shepherd's soul, souls that possess the resonant movement and weight of the sea. Summer days on the mountain plateaus, the shepherd stretches out in the grass with his face to the sky. The clouds of a life of seaweed and algae, blooming grasses in the breasts of the waves like fountains of milk in the breasts of women. Sometimes when the expanse is all blue after the north wind passes, a little white sail still makes its way in the high winds toward the horizon's distant ports. Hmm. Gorgeous. Yeah. And perhaps I'll read a, a little bit from the very beginning of, do we have time, Stephen? We're running over yeah. or? I think, We're yeah, okay. I mean, a few more minutes and I, you know, um, I want to thank you both again and, and mm -hmm. thank everyone for joining us. And my only regret is that we're not doing this in person in Point Reyes because I feel like we could just continue the conversation out in the wind and uh, it would be a very appropriate, it would feel very appropriate for this. It would indeed. Yeah. Well, maybe we will someday. Yeah, the, the offer, the door is open. Oh, that's great. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you want, I'll just read, it's very short, but it's the very beginning of, um, of Melville. And again, I, I, I have to mention that Giono was a, a landlubber. I mean, he, he never, he must have been out on the water in the Mediterranean, but he was never out on the open ocean. Um, but he wrote this book, Fragment of Paradis, which is all about a sea voyage of exploration. And he, he drew all of it from reading these chronicles, journals of old explorers. But this is right from the start of Melville. He says, um, speaking of Moby Dick, Melville's book was my foreign companion. I took it with me regularly on my hikes across the hills. As soon as I entered those vast wave-like but motionless solitudes, I'd sit down under a pine and lean against its trunk. All I needed was to pull out this book, which was already flapping in the wind, to sense the manifold life of the seas swell up below and all around me. Countless times I felt the rigging hiss over my head, the earth heave under my feet like the deck of a whaler, and the trunk of the pine groan and sway against my back like a mast heavy with wind-filled sails. Just incredible. Um, so, and, and this rediscovery and this continual rediscovering the English English for English language readers at least of, of Giono's work so we know there's at least one more coming Paul that you're working on and, and well, there, may, there will be I'm sure there will be more after that there's some that still have never been translated and I would argue even though the editions that Jack brought out back in the 80s were so essential they probably some of those stand to be retranslated, as all great works need to be retranslated. Well, those were, I, if I'm not mistaken, those were the original English translations, they right? Were. That were in Great Britain um, in yeah. the 30s and 40s. So, yeah. you know, the idea that every generation needs a new translation really comes in to play here, you know? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. And for, yeah, and for a writer who feels somehow so, relevant to our our time in this I mean almost mm -hmm. uncanny ways um, of all the things that Giono was sort of preoccupied with um I could keep we could just keep talking about this um but we should the the, the bell the bells were chiming uh for <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah right. but there's so much more to touch on um I'll just say quickly if if someone who had not read Giono what would you recommend they pick mm -hmm. up first 
Well, you know, it, it's tempting to say the man who planted trees because it's so accessible and, you know, um, it, 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 it brings you into his world and it touches on contemporary issues around the environment and ecology and all of that. Um, but other than that, I would say the Serpent of Stars. <laughs> Uh, yes, I I have to agree. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. for me, it, um, uh, the man who planted trees is good. Is a good, you know, just to get a a taste. But I yeah. feel like the serpent of stars just it's still um, there's a shepherd's play in it for Pete's sake. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. like it. it yeah. 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 No, it's it's an amazing. Yeah. And we could spend a I whole mean, afternoon. Oh, I was gonna yeah. say we could spend a whole afternoon talking about Giono, Giono's use of shepherds in his fiction. Yeah. That, that's a whole yeah uh, symposium. Right. Yeah, well, joy of, yeah. joy of man's desiring may be the real sort of as you know most um, concentrated treatment mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it could it could do with retranslating. I I would argue. There you go, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jody. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both and thank Jack, of course, for joining us. Uh, for those who don't know, Jack's granddaughter was was uh, I think I saw her pop her head in the door behind him at one point, and and that takes precedence over any uh, <laughs> online event. Um, very understandable. Uh, um, yeah, but for Paul sure. and Jody. Great to have you here. Great to meet you this way. And and yeah, let's let's do this in person in Point Reyes and spend an afternoon. Uh, we'll go for a walk and we'll talk about right. Giono. And <laughs> would love, would love, love, to, love to do that. Love to do that. Love yeah. To do that. Yeah. yeah. And for those watching, we I'm gonna share the the replay. We'll get this on YouTube and uh, we're gonna just keep the pressure on and get some more Giono translated and maybe some retranslations in the works. That would be an, an amazing outcome of uh, conversations like this. Um, just uh, thank you both for, for being here and for your translations. You know, the, you've, you've helped me rediscover this writer who I think is vitally important and, and, and so many other ways, um, just a uh, language that, that is alive and, and a sensibility that feels um, one that we should pay attention to. Um, so thank you both, and uh, I'll see you in Point Reyes in the near future. Okay. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Bye. Bye. Bye.